This will be my first video now dealing with the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary in my debate with Keith Truth. The second debate will uh, deal with Sola Scriptura. This one with the Bible and historical aspects of the immaculate conception. Let me begin by saying that the dogma of the Catholic Church is this, that from the moment of her conception, that Mary was uh, preserved without the stain of original sin. That is the short form of it. You can find the long part of it online if you want to. But basically that from the moment of her, her conception, Mary was preserved without the stain of original sin. She was conceived as any normal person would be. But through a divine intervention of God, she was preserved without the stain of original sin, or sana macula. Now then, this does not refer to mother's mother and father, so please don't make any comments about that. It doesn't refer to her mother and father at all. It only re applies to uh, the Virgin Mary and her conception. Catholic doctrines or dogmas don't occur overnight either. Uh, sometimes it takes years before the evidence and the arguments are presented to where the Catholic Church can define it as dogma or that it's not dogma. And I say it's not something that just happens overnight. Uh, and third, the Catholic scholars use both logic and reason in their interpretation. I think most Protestant scholars do the same thing. You have to use logic and reason in your interpretations. Uh, with that, let me begin the biblical evidence now. And to say this to begin with, first of all, a doctrine does not have to be uh, explicitly uh, shown in the Bible. If a person can show where a doctrine is implicitly stated, and define that doctrine, then it is much as revealed truth as anything else is, much like the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is implicit in the Bible. It's not anywhere where imp uh, implicitly uh, or, or explicitly it says, here's the doctrine of the Trinity. But implicitly, you can look at different verses of Scripture, and you can define what is the Trinity. With that said, let me get into Genesis uh, 3, 14, and 15. And I use 14 for this reason to show that it is the serpent who God is speaking to. <clears throat> and he says to the serpent in verse uh, 15, I will put uh, enmity between you and the woman. So right away you see there's going to be a hostility between the woman and Satan, who is, who is the serpent. But not only that, it says I will also put uh, enmity between <coughs> uh, your seed and her seed. In other words, there's going to be this hostility between the seed of Satan <clears throat> and a hostility between uh, the seed of the woman. Now then, the seed of the woman, as anybody knows, is going to be Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman, then the woman being spoken about here can only be the Virgin Mary. And there's going to be just as much hostility between Satan and the woman as there's going to be between the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman. The seed of Satan would be what? Sin and evil. The, uh, the uh, seed of the offspring, uh, Jesus Christ, would be righteousness and grace. <clears throat> so right away there's going to be a hostility between the woman and Satan and the seeds of uh, the woman and the seeds of Satan, Jesus Christ and sin. It's going to be opposition, total opposition, total hostility between the two. <clears throat> Mary can no more be involved with sin than Jesus Christ can be involved with sin. Uh, now then, there is a uh, debate that's gone over years as to who who do, who actually does the crushing. <clears throat> uh, some Catholic scholars would say that it's Mary who does this cru the crushing. I've read other scholars who wasn't sure about it. But here's the thing about it. It has been an ongoing debate for years as to who is actually being applied to when it says he. In fact, some people have gone so far as to change it to it rather than he or she at all and not knowing themselves. <clears throat> they simply applied it and said it. Now then, uh, I'm sure the key truth will probably say that the he there is in the masculine form and that it can only refer to he and not to the woman. Uh, first of all, if he says that, he has not done any research uh, to find out what is the actual truth about it because the word he there, even though some scholars use the word he, uh, he will not define it as that he could be actually uh, a feminine or masculine according to the Hebrew language. In fact, in an article I was reading on in the Jewish Encyclopedia, it says this when referring to this very thing. 
<coughs> and it said, it was said this, and I quote from the Jewish Encyclopedia, <coughs> and I'll put the link at the bottom of the page for anyone who wants to read this article. But quoting it, it says, and I quote, new plural forms are used where the older language has only the singular or the singular is used where the older language has only the plural. Masculine nouns are abstracted from the older feminine noun, feminine uh, nouns, uh, forms, and new feminine forms are built from older masculine forms. So nouns as double plural endings, the masculine ending is sometimes used where the older language has the feminine, and or vice versa. So the the, the basic point is that he can re re refer, refer back to the woman, or I can also refer to the man, or I can refer to both of them. Uh, to simply say that he is only masculine is totally disingenuous and show that the proper research has not been done to determine that in the old language of the Hebrew, uh, he can be either masculine or feminine, and they're interchangeable words. They could refer to Jesus, could refer to Mary here, <coughs> or he could f refer to both of them. <coughs> now then, let's look at uh, Luke 128. Uh, that talks about the highly favored one. And when you look at Luke 128, where it says highly favored, it is the Greek word uh, kekeratomene. Uh, and it is a perfect past participle, which means an action completed in the past, but is ongoing for that day. In other words, Mary just didn't all of a sudden receive grace. It's something she had already received in the past. And the Catholic Church defines that as the Immaculate, immaculate Conception, where she was conceived without the stain of original sin. Uh, perfect past, uh, perfect uh, passive participle, something that is ongoing, something that was received in the past, but applies to the present. It's just like, it is finished at Calvary. Uh, in much the same way, when Jesus said it is finished, it wasn't just a one-day thing. It is an ongoing for future generations, and it also applies to past generations who would receive the benefits of Calvary. <coughs> now then, I want to look at Luke 142 for a minute. And in Luke 142, you will see where it says, uh, Blessed is, is the, uh, where uh, Elizabeth, in, in being inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, Blessed are thee, Mary, and the fruit of thy womb, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Uh, now then, Blessed is Ula Gemini. And, and note in there that the same word used for Jesus, where Jesus is blessed, is the same Greek word used where Mary is blessed, Ula Gemini. Both words are the same. They're not different. That meaning why, however Jesus is blessed, Mary is blessed in the same way. Jesus was born without the stain of original sin. Uh, and and if, if Mary is blessed in the same way, then Mary is also born without the stain of original sin. And right away, Keith will want to use uh, Luke 147, where it talks about Mary needing a Savior. Absolutely true. Uh, the Catholic Church doesn't may say Mary is the Savior or didn't need to be saved. Uh, it just Mary was saved in a different way than we are. <clears throat> Mary was saved by the merits of Jesus Christ, nothing under her own merits. But she was preserved from the stain of original sin in God's um, uh, salvation history. Uh, it's like we, if, if, if a bridge were out and, and, and cars were going off this bridge one after another, uh, look at that bridge as sin that we're all stepping off into. But rather than allowing Mary to go off that bridge, God saved her in a different way. Uh, and she needed a savior just like we all do. It's simply God saved her in a different way. And right away we'll say, well, oh, God doesn't have different ways to save people. Well, you're limiting God then to how he can save people and how he can't. And believe me, my friend, none of you are God. You cannot determine how God saves people and how he doesn't save people. <clears throat> and at the, at the same time, you would have to rule out where the Bible says that with God all things are possible. You would have to say, well, no, all things might be possible with God, but he can't save someone that way. If you say that, then you're, you're calling the Bible a liar and, can't say, and you can't say then that with God all things are possible. So with God, all things are possible. And if this was possible, this is the way God chose to do it. He saved Mary in a different way because she played a role in our salvation history. Uh, and I'll deal with the historical aspect uh, in just a moment. What I'm going to do in this historical presentation is present just a few of the church fathers and list more references in my uh, 
rebuttal of Keith Truth's uh, first video up on the Immaculate Conception. Uh, no. First of all, <laughs> you can read uh, Nature and Grace by <laughs> Augustinian and in volume 23 in the third century, he is talking about the sinless Mary or the Immaculate Conception. Augustinian of Hippo in chapter 42 of Nature's and Grace, book 2, again talks about the sin, sin, sinlessness or implicit implication of the uh, Immaculate Conception. What? Cyril of Jerusalem, who lived in the uh, second century in lecture 12, talks about the sinlessness of Mary and implies the Immaculate Conception. At the Council of Trent in 1547 implied the sinlessness of Mary. Uh, on a website I found by David MacDonald, who is a Catholic, quotes Luther on the Immaculate Conception when he says this, and I quote, It is sweet and pious belief that the infusion of Mary's soul was effected without original sin, so that in the very fusion of her soul she was also purified from original sin and adored with uh, God's gift, receiving a pure soul fused by God, Thus, from the first moment she began to live, she was free from all sin. And that is Luther's sermon on the day of the Immaculate Conception of the Mother of God in 1527. End quote on that. As I said, I wanted to mention some church fathers who had already began talking about this. So it's not as Keith wants to present as something just came up, or that it wasn't at least implicitly, uh, implicitly applied to. Uh, I've listed several of the church fathers. I've quoted Martin Luther talking about the Immaculate Conception. Uh, but I would deal more with this and present more evidence of this when I refute uh, his evidence, or what he calls evidence, about the Immaculate Conception. Until then, this has been God is saying, God bless.